Today on Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look back at one of the more curious titles to come out of Sierra Online back in the 80s, The Black Cauldron, based on the Disney movie of the same name, which was based on the first two books in the Chronicles of Prydain series, written by Lloyd Alexander. Now, given that the movie went severely over budget and earned the title of The Film That Almost Killed Disney, the fact that this game even got made and published is just weird to think about. But I'm glad it did, because this game definitely plays a lot differently than you might expect at first glance. In fact, any eagle-eyed viewers watching right now have probably already noticed something that seems missing from the game. Need a hint? Well, there's something that's supposed to go right here. Yep, this game was built using Sierra's AGI Adventure Game Interpreter Engine, designed to merge graphical movement and representations of the world and characters with a text parser to tell the game what actions you wish to perform, but this game in particular does not have a text parser. In fact, this bottom area of the screen goes pretty much unused for the entirety of the DOS version of the game. So, just to help fill your screen better, let's do this. But yeah, since the target audience for the movie was children, Sierra's task was to make the game approachable for younger players. So instead of having a text parser, all interaction in the game is boiled down to four function keys. A look key, a use key, a key to select an item in your inventory, and a key to use your selected item. The game otherwise plays exactly as you would expect a Sierra AGI title to play. As for the quality of the game itself, well, it's kind of hard to comment on. The game can follow the events of the movie pretty closely, and in fact, if you've seen the movie, you'll likely have a much easier time solving some of the puzzles in here. But the game also has branching paths and multiple endings, something that's kind of hard to do with a feature film. But it also still manages to have some of the usual Sierra tropes, which make the game unnecessarily more difficult. Made worse by the fact that you don't have a text parser. As every single time I got stuck, I'm pretty sure I would have figured out what to do much faster if I could just type in my actions instead of relying on the function keys, and then seeing how the game would respond to that. Well, all that said, the game doesn't get as egregious as most Sierra titles, but even with the simplified action commands, I wouldn't call this game easy. Not your first time through, anyways. The Black Cauldron was developed and published by Sierra Online in 1986, and is a one-player, inventory-based adventure game. It supports all the common video modes for the time, including composite CGA for those connecting their PC through to a television screen, plus later revisions also have MCGA support to make up for the fact that MCGA is not backwards compatible with EGA, but it doesn't change any of the graphics. As for audio, it supports both the PC speaker and Tandy 3 voice sound, with the Tandy support being the obvious choice to go with, though this means running the game on a Tandy system with Tandy graphics or in that manner through an emulator. As for its current release date, it's supposedly freeware now, as Al Lowe, the guy at Sierra who did most of the work on this title, has had it up on his website for download for practically a decade now, maybe even longer, along with a few other Sierra titles that he'd worked on. Now, way back when I covered Donald Duck's Playground, some people wondered if Al Lowe even had permission to release any of these old Sierra titles on his site. Well, even if he didn't, the powers to be haven't tried to stop him this many years later, so I doubt it's much of a concern. Uh, heck, this is the same reasoning as how Abandonware sites are able to keep their uploads up. But at least in this case, it's all stuff he played the main role in making. So I'd call that at least a little more legit than average. However, if you want a physical copy, things get a little tricky. Well, first of all, even though the movie isn't even remotely rare or hard to find, this game is. Not only did it come out from multiple platforms, which makes it just that much harder to get a copy for the platform you want, but it's also a little higher in price than typical for old games, selling for around $10 to $20 for loose discs and around $50 for fully boxed copies. The other thing you have to be careful about if you want to get a physical copy, specifically for DOS, is that you don't mix it up with the PC booter version. Yes, there's both a PC booter version and a DOS version, similar to how it ended up with King's Quest, seeing as this is the third AGI title ever made. The main way you can tell the difference is by the discs, as the discs for DOS will just flat out say MS-DOS right on their labels. However, without a shot of the discs, you want to look in the bottom left corner of the front of the box. If you see a round sticker that's a ways away from the corner, it's the PC booter version. And if you see a long rectangular sticker that's right down in that corner, it's the DOS version. 
Now, you can still technically run PC booter software in DOSBox, but there's a bit more work that goes into doing that. Plus, the PC booter version uses the older version of the AGI engine, which showed descriptive text at the bottom of the screen as opposed to center screen. Just some things to keep in mind if you decide to go that route instead. Not much point doing a full story section here, as there's very little backstory. The game takes place in the fantasy world of Prydain, where you play the role of an assistant pig keeper named Terran, under the employ of Dalbin the Enchanter, who looks after a very important pig named Henwen. A Terran dreams of becoming a great hero, feeling he could fulfill that dream if he was just given a chance. He needs to be careful what he wishes for though, because not long into the game you discover Henwen actually has magic powers, able to divine past events by touching a bowl of water. In doing this, she produces a vision of the Horned King, an evil ruler who is now actively searching for Henwen to use her powers to reveal the location of the Black Cauldron, a device which would give the king unspeakable powers. Your second task in the game is thus to find a way to get Henwen to safety. Your first task was to feed her. Actually, this leads into one of the core aspects of this game right away. Since this was made so early after King's Quest, where every problem tended to have more than one solution, this game is no different. The very first thing you have to do is feed Henwen, and chances are you'll be feeding her some gruel prepared specially for her, as the most obvious food for you to find. But when I got stuck later on, I discovered this right here is not just some decorative part of the house, it's a shed with some corn stashed away specifically for Henwen. As I mentioned earlier, not having a means to type in exactly what I want to look at means I wasn't able to get more details about the house in this scene, meaning I had no idea there was even a shed here. Well, yes, if you press the look key while near it, it'll tell you, but I'm not used to playing AGI games like that. Plus, it doesn't always help. This bridge, for instance, will tell you the same thing all the time from virtually any position you look at it, unless you somehow get desperate enough to step in the shallow water and look at it from the right side, and only then will the game tell you that there's a magic wallet under the bridge which produces unlimited amounts of food. I guess maybe that one's on me. Like Looking under bridges is kind of an obvious for a lot of games, but this wallet is a curious thing, because without it, you are ultimately limited to five pieces of food for yourself. Three portions of bread, an apple, and some cookies. Run out of food, and sooner or later, you'll become too hungry to continue your journey. That's another thing I find odd too, is that for a game that's supposed to be geared more towards kids, that there would be food and water mechanics. Now, water is thankfully less of an issue, since you can refill your water flask in many places where there's clean water, and it lasts for a few drinks. The first time I tried to refill it though, I kinda picked a bad spot, because the rapid currents ripped it from my grasp. Fortunately though, the game's not completely evil about this. If you go upstream, you'll ultimately find the flask resting against some rocks. In fact, that is one thing that's unique about this game compared to most AGI titles, is that there's very little in the way of Walking Dead scenarios. You can end up in situations which prevent you from getting certain endings, but as far as I can tell, short of running out of food and water, it's not possible to end up in an unwinnable state. That said, it can be a little tricky trying to figure out where to go. Well, not far into the game, the Horn King will start sending some of his minions to capture Henwen, and just like in the movie, probably will succeed sooner or later, forcing you to make an attempt to rescue her. Though it is indeed possible to get her to safety beforehand. Either way though, you have to navigate through bizarre mazes, which don't really make it clear where you can even go or where you're supposed to end up. Uh, to head to the Horn King's castle, you need to get past this screen, but there's only one way through, and it's not even slightly intuitive how you're supposed to get through this. If you don't make your way through here, taking the exact path that I'm taking, you'll get blocked by something. Now, to save Henwen early, you have to do something similar, finding a secret house buried amongst these trees, but this one's even less obvious. This is also how you get the cookies if you needed the additional food item. Now I will admit, none of the things I'm complaining about here are things I wouldn't have been able to figure out on my own if I was spending hours at a time playing this game. But there's enough fiddly aspects like this which aren't explained well enough that you have to take a lot of wild guesses to find them all, and you're gonna feel like you're stuck quite frequently because of this. Then just like with any inventory based adventure game, once you know what to do, this game tends to go by really fast, especially if you turn the speed up. But I did say there's multiple endings. 
So the way you progress through this game alters some of the possibilities. For instance, how you get Henwin to safety determines how you get into the kingdom of the Fair Folk to get the magic mirror and flying dust. Though I noticed the flying dust is kind of a missed opportunity, since you're unable to use it in almost every spot where you'd want to. The only exception being if you're trying to cross the swamp. But once you know about hopping across rocks, the swamp isn't too bad to do without it. Though again, it's kind of fiddly with the exact positions you want to jump from, and you can end up missing your jumps really easily if you're not super precise. One thing you have to be really careful about is if Henwen gets captured and you go to rescue her. The moment you see Henwen and the Horn King together in the same room, a fairly short timer is started in the background. If this timer then expires at any point, Henwen completes the vision and you lose the game. So you absolutely must get Henwen out of this room once this chain of events has started, or you lose. Oh, and I should point out too that this kitchen here is completely useless as far as I can tell. Which kind of makes me wonder if maybe there were bigger plans for it. I'm actually running out of stuff to talk about, so I'll mention a couple interesting tidbits that I noticed while going through this. The first is that usually my game design skills allow me to pick into what's happening in a game really well, but this is one of the very few games where those same skills did me a disservice instead. And once you find your way into the catacombs after being locked up in the castle's dungeons, you'll meet a princess with a magic bauble that floats around seemingly at random. And for the most part, this bobble is useless. In fact, when I got to this room here, I saw the bobble disappear and thought to myself, <laughs> it just clipped past a masking plane in the back. Because it ultimately did come back on screen around the same point and just kept moving around randomly. But as I was getting stuck at one point, I came back here again and saw the bobble intentionally move towards and disappear in the exact same spot and I finally realized, wait, that wasn't random. If not for my knowledge of how the AGI engine works, I might have figured that out the first time and not gotten stuck for over half an hour. Because again, the key for looking around doesn't always give you any really good information about your surroundings. You have to go up to stuff and investigate it from all angles to be absolutely certain it's nothing important, no matter how mundane it looks. Lastly, I normally wouldn't do this, but because this game has multiple endings, I'm going to spoil the worst ending, and there's a simple reason for why because the worst ending is the hardest ending to get, since you pretty much have to know the story ahead of time, and it's very easy to lock yourself out of being able to get it very early in a run. Now, I'm not going to spoil how to get this ending, but if you know the story, then you probably have a pretty good idea of how this is possible. I also wanted to spoil it because, jeez, I think this is about as violent as you can get without crossing the graphic violence threshold. This was a freaking Disney movie, right? Actually, just before writing the script, I learned that children were literally running out of a test screening room when the final scenes of this movie was reached, and they ultimately trimmed 12 whole minutes out of the movie to bring the intensity down. So, kind of left wondering just how crazy this could have been. Overall, The Black Cauldron is a typical Sierra adventure game, but with fewer opportunities to screw yourself over, but also fewer ways to investigate the world around you to figure out what you're doing. It's funny because the design is definitely geared towards kids, but as an adult, I still ran into plenty of issues trying to play through this for my first time. But because it's a very short game, you thankfully won't end up stuck for large periods of time, as long as you persist and investigate every possibility. Essentially, this isn't as good as King's Quest, but as far as movie-based games are concerned, it follows the movie extremely well, offers alternate possibilities, and is still playable all the same. Now, given its present freeware status as of making this video, I would say definitely give it a try if you like the old Sierra AGI stuff, but if you're not into these old Sierra Adventure games, then you're not missing anything too special by giving this one a pass. In terms of setting this up in DOSBox, since you won't get the Tandy sound and music without the game thinking you're running it on a Tandy system, it's important to make sure to set the machine type to Tandy. Now you can leave cycle set to auto as well, though if you want to use a joystick or gamepad, you also need to make sure to turn off timed intervals. Though given some of the things you have to do in terms of movement, I would think a joystick or gamepad might be tricky to use, so I recommend sticking with the keyboard for this one. And that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next up will be another ADG Pro video coming out on Saturday, May 1st, where we're going to be exploring some games within a game. Yeah, there's actually enough content in such a DOS game to warrant dedicating a full video to this, so be sure to stay tuned for the start of May to see which DOS game it is which has so much extra content buried inside it.
Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small random selection of you all.